Now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get, and that is inflate the currency. They don't say debase the currency. They don't say devalue the currency. They don't say cheat the people who are saved. They say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply, without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy, will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the U.S. dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought, for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates. For in our financial system, money is debt. And debt is money. Here is a chart of the U.S. money supply from 1950 to 2006. Here is a chart of the U.S. national debt for the same period. How interesting it is that the trends are virtually the same. For the more money there is, the more debt there is. The more debt there is, the more money there is. To put it a different way, every single dollar in your wallet is owed to somebody by somebody. For remember, the only way the money can come into existence is from loans. Therefore, if everyone in the country were able to pay off all debts, including the government, there would not be one dollar in circulation. In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived, and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Bank, which is not a government institution, they have nothing to do with the federal government. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation. And it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself. The application 
of interest. When the government borrows money from the Fed, or when a person borrows money from a bank, it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest. In other words, almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well. But if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Banks create only the amount of the principal. They don't create the money to pay the interest. Where is that supposed to come from? The only place borrowers can go to obtain the money to pay interest is the general economy's overall money supply. But almost all that overall money supply has been created exactly the same way as bank credit that has to be paid back with more than was created. So everywhere there are other borrowers in the same situation, frantically trying to obtain the money they need to pay back both principal and interest from a total money pool which contains only principal. More and more new debt money has to be created to satisfy today's demands for money to service the previous debt. But of course this just makes the total debt bigger and that means more interest must ultimately be paid, resulting in an ever-escalating and inescapable spiral of mounting indebtedness. It is only the time lag between money's creation as new loans and its repayment that keeps the overall shortage of money from catching up and bankrupting the entire system. However, as the bank's insatiable credit monster gets bigger and bigger, the need to create more and more debt money to feed it becomes increasingly urgent. A rational person has to ask, can this really go on forever? Isn't a collapse inevitable? Mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and it is the fear of losing assets coupled with the struggle to keep up with the perpetual debt and inflation inherent in the system, compounded by the inescapable scarcity within the money supply itself, created by the interest that can never be repaid, that invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. Imagine a society and economy that can endure for centuries because, instead of plundering its capital stores of energy, it restricts itself to present-day income. No more wood is harvested than grows in the same period. All energy is renewable, solar, gravitational, geothermal, magnetic, and whatever else we discover. This society lives within the limits of its non-renewable resources by reusing and recycling everything and the population just replaces itself. Such a society could never function using a money system utterly dependent on perpetually accelerating growth. A stable economy would need a money supply at least capable of remaining stable without collapsing. Let's say the total volume of this stable money supply is represented by this big circle. Let's also imagine that money lenders must actually have existing money to lend. If some people within this money supply begin systematically lending money at interest, their share of the money supply will grow. If they continually re-loan at interest all the money that gets paid back, what's the inevitable result? Whether it's gold, fiat or debt money doesn't matter. The money lenders will end up with all the money. And after the foreclosures and bankruptcies are all filed, they'll get all the real property too. For, at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. 
they are the true masters along with the corporations and governments they support. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this. 